It is a good life we lead, brother. <sighs> the best. May it never change. And may it never change us. Assassin's Creed 2. This is a really important game for pretty much everyone concerned. This is kind of the game that ended up cementing Ubisoft's bread and butter to this very day. I know what you're thinking, okay, there was another Assassin's Creed before that that did basically what this game did, but that game was really sort of a not very good proof of concept. This is the one that I think if it didn't sell half as well as it did, well, not only would we not have Assassin's Creed games to this point, but we wouldn't be playing Far Cry and climbing radio towers and seeing the camera zoom around it in a circle so that we can see everything around it. We wouldn't be playing so many other giant Ubisoft sandboxes collecting random nonsense. We wouldn't be doing things that are basically Assassin's Creed in other Ubisoft titles that don't even have Assassin's Creed in the title, including games that are Assassin's Creed games that really kind of aren't, because, let's just be honest, Assassin's Creed hasn't been Assassin's Creed since 3, but that's a whole different rant for a different day. Assassin's Creed 2 is a very important game to me personally, because this was the third game of the last console generation I ever got to play. When I first got my PS3, I was stuck playing White Knight Chronicles for months, and god, that was a dark time, that game was awful, and you know, then I replaced it with the much, much better Demon Souls, but it wasn't until Assassin's Creed that I really felt like something really knocked it out of the park. So this game, to me, is very special. And when I saw the Assassin's Creed Ezio collection for sale on my Xbox One for about $5, I kind of just had to jump on it. And then I realized I'm going to be playing this a lot in my spare time, I might as well record it and get a review out of it, so here we are. Now, Assassin's Creed 2 kind of has two different stories. One story, set in the present date, follows the blandest human ever conceived, Desmond Miles, and uh, I mean, I'm just gonna stop right there and say his entire story and all of the present day stuff is completely worthless in the entire Assassin's Creed franchise. Ubisoft at the time had no idea what they were really doing with it, and to this day, they really don't know what they're doing with it. To the point where most of the time, you get like maybe a quick 10 second cameo from someone, and then more assurance that there's gonna be more future stuff in the future when it's still gone nowhere 10 years later. But he's been captured by the enemies of the Assassins, the Templar Knights, well, they're, they're modern equivalent that still allegedly exist, and he's being tortured into living the memories of his past Assassin ancestors to gain some sort of leg up on the Assassin Order. He has now since been broken out and forced to relive the memories of a past ancestor so that he can gain skills to get the leg up on the Templar Order. His story sucks. Okay? I mean, that's a constant for every game he's in. To the point where, I mean, spoilers, they completely write him out of the story, which, probably for the best. The B plot of this game, which is, you know, the main plot, actually follows his ancestor Ezio Auditore da Firenze, a young man who's about to have the worst day of his life. His father and brothers are murdered in front of him, and now he has to basically dedicate his entire life to revenge. And in doing so, he learns that he is in fact an assassin, and the entire game is spent living the life of this man, tempering his anger and learning how to put his skills to the test and not only achieve his victory over the foes who have wronged his entire family, but in turn to make use of the legacy he's been given, whether he was aware of it or not. This is where this game hits it out of the park in terms of story. Because Assassin's Creed is not a series I would ever consider being terribly good at characterization. Ezio is one of the few really well-written characters this series has ever had. I would argue he's the best written character this series has ever had. And honestly, he's probably one of my favorite characters to come out of the past decade. And I think part of that is simply the fact that you see him grow through his entire life. He starts out as a brash, hot-blooded youth who doesn't really think about his actions so much as he just lives by instinct. But then you see him grow. You see him slow down and take a look at what he does and how he can approach the situation to actually think about what he's going to do and how his actions impact others. You know, he, he turns into a wise man over the course of the 20 years this game sort of lasts through his life. And, and you can see that change as you go. And it's seeing that slow development of a character. And indeed, he has a very large arc 
again, spanning 20 years compartmentalized into about 15 or so chapters, that really does show him grow as a character and show his complexities. Yes, he's a man that is consumed by rage and a need for vengeance, but when you see him at the start, he is a goofy playboy, and by the end, he's still willing to crack jokes and make passes at women, you know? There's something enduring to this man. He's not Batman. He's not a completely one-dimensional character who only cares for revenge. He's willing to still hang out and goof around with his buddy Leonardo da Vinci, which, yeah, this game likes to inject historical figures. This series is kind of famous for that to the point where it feels like Magic School Bus, but it's not that bad here. Here it's just kind of enduring, and it lends to filling out the world and feeling like you're a part of something greater. And I mean, it just shows how well-rounded and how multifaceted a character Ezio is. This guy is one of my favorite characters in the past 10 years, and considering this is Assassin's Creed, the series that also brings you Desmond Miles, Altair Ibn La Ahad, Connor, half the Fry twins, I, I could go on, I've played most of the main games in this series, this is not a series for good writing. But they absolutely hit it out of the park with this character, and I will always give them credit for Ezio. That said, as much as I will praise the writing and characterization in this game, this scene also exists. You have my thanks. Keep the sword, Ezio. Do I know you from somewhere? Don't you recognize me? It's a me, Mario! Yeah, I think the technical term for what we just witnessed was a technicolor yawn. But I mean, for every single one of those scenes, there's a bunch of other really brilliant scenes that help characterize Ezio and the world around him, and really shows his growth and progress. So, let's, let's just ignore that one really cringe bit. Well, let's try to anyway. Now the gameplay to Assassin's Creed 2, well, it's got its ups and its downs. It definitely feels dated compared to more modern Assassin's Creed games for sure, but you can still see a lot of problems this game has in the modern ones as well, as well as a few interesting bits of jank here and there. The first thing that struck me was the opening sequence. When I first played this 10 years ago, I thought it was a pretty neat idea. You play as Desmond escaping this Templar facility. Except you have to understand, Desmond is external to this game. The entire game is focusing on Ezio, because you're reliving his memories. And, you know, if you kill Ezio, or you do something that he wouldn't do, such as killing a bunch of civilians, well, they basically just remove him from the timeline and restart, so that you can relive his life properly. You can't do that with Desmond. So, their solution to this, because they couldn't have Desmond killed at any point, because it would not make sense from a realistic perspective, I guess, is he's invincible. So while you're supposed to be sneaking around this facility not getting caught, you can also lead a conga line of every single enemy in the game down a path until your attack love interest kills them for you because you can't be asked. And then they proceed to give you a forced fight where you, once again, don't have to fight, but they kind of force you to. And this leads me to the second peculiarity in this game. That, like, for the next five hours, they're still going to proceed to teach you how to fight even though in this opening tutorial, they already do that. There's a lot of redundancy here, and I have no idea why. And since we're still talking about combat, I can complain to no end about it, because it's not very good. I don't think Assassin's Creed has ever been a game about really good combat, although it's certainly gotten better over the years. This is a game where, despite the fact that you've got about six weapons on you at all times, as well as the ability to disarm opponents, counter, strafe, dodge out of the way, you can beat pretty much every opponent by just mashing the attack button. Sometimes you'll get an enemy that deflects some attacks, but, you know, keep at it, you'll beat him. Sometimes you'll run to an enemy that can jump back, but, I mean, pin him against a wall, he's dead. Hell, the final boss is literally just button mashing the attack button. It's really, truly bizarre that this game gives you so many options and so much depth, and yet it doesn't actually make you use them. And I guess that's to give you open options to use the combat to your strengths or something, but it really does feel like at the end of the day, while they give you options, combat is still really bloody boring, and it just feels long and drawn out at any point. The second aspect of gameplay we can talk about is stealth, because, and I have no idea why, some people consider Assassin's Creed to be a stealth game. As a fan of stealth games, I find that offensive. It's... I think the not very stealthy Metal Gear Solid is more of a stealth game than this, but stealth in this game basically just requires you to hide in a group of about four women, which 
I mean, you're large hooded men brandishing about half a dozen weapons at all times and is heavily armored. Yeah, that's, that's not going to be a problem at all. That's not suspicious. But, you know, if you do things that are socially unacceptable or you get to points in the story where they say, hey, you're going to get hunted, well, then the game swaps to a second mode, which is infamy, at which point enemies will just pretty much on-site attack you. Except most of the time enemies kind of charge at you and try and attack you after about seeing you for three seconds anyway, so it's weird. But you can remove this infamy by paying off heralds to not talk about you, by killing witnesses, which seems a little strange because they're always in public anyway, as well as ripping off wanted posters that are for some reason posted on walls about 20 feet in the air, only available by scaffolding or parkour. How any of these people are actually seeing these to recognize Ezio to begin with is baffling to me to this day. Also so this is very clearly a picture of just some face in a hood. You can't see anything about this guy. How are these wanted posters actually effective? Now the third aspect of Assassin's Creed, and I would indeed argue kind of mechanically speaking the main part of Assassin's Creed is focusing on parkour. Climbing around environments, scaling buildings, and really getting intimate with Renaissance Italy buildings is amazing to me because I have a fascination with architecture, of course. It's a lot of fun just exploring this world as some kind of crazy monkey man. It is absolutely fantastic for the most part, but there is a lot of jank to it. A problem that still persists today, but to nowhere near the same degree, is trying to climb a simple piece of environment only for the game to misinterpret your inputs and think that you want to jump off a cliff to your death. Yeah, that still happens today, but it happens so much more in this game, and it's a little bit frustrating. And it's an absolute shame because I think that parkour is probably one of the most important aspects to Assassin's Creed, seeing as this game has its roots in the really good 3D Prince of Persia games. Well, game. Sands of time, let's just be honest. But while it does screw up from time to time, it has a very simple interface. You hold one of the shoulder buttons, you hold down A, and you just aim for where you want to jump, and about 85% of the time, the game will know where you want to go, and it will put you there. Now, of course, it's Assassin's Creed. It's a game about killing dudes. And, of course, because you're a revenge-fueled assassin, killing dudes is important to you. Well, you can kill dudes, you've got lots of tools to do so, and as you progress through the game, you learn more and more techniques to kill dudes. It's great. However, and I'm not gonna lie, this it might be me misremembering the first game, because it has been forever since I played the first Assassin's Creed. Again, it wasn't really all that good. I remember the first Assassin's Creed game basically about discerning your targets, and then just approaching and then killing them however you wanted. It was a very open, very natural, very fluid system that really felt like, you know, you were ultimately achieving your mission your way. Well, Assassin's Creed 2 kind of throws that to the wind in favor of trying to tell a better story. And to be fair, like I said, this game tells an excellent story. But unfortunately, it means that nine times out of 10, killing your target is kind of a very scripted, very structured event. Unless you like really screw up and then they run off and then you have to kind of chase them before they get too far away and you die. And it kind of sucks because I, I really liked how free flowing some of the assassinations in the previous game were. It was like the one good thing that game had going for it. And unfortunately, this would be a trend that continues for quite a while. In addition, there are a couple basic mission structures that this game would feature, that later games would also feature, that just don't really work. There's an eavesdropping mission where you kind of have to stand around uh, an NPC and listen to them and follow them closely without them detecting you. Again, this game isn't really made for stealth, so it's not really enjoyable, and you really just have to get a glimpse of them with your camera in order to stay within range of them because, you know, that's that's how listening to people and tailing them properly works. But more problematic to me is one of sort of like the side mission events, which is chases. Sometimes you'll scare off an enemy and you have to kill them before they alert their buddies. And these just flat out don't work because they're entirely scripted. I've run into a couple instances where I'd actually catch up to them and kill them, only for the game to somehow think that I guess I was in a wall or something because I would then have no control over my character, and then my character would just die after a while because either enemies would have been following him or just the game kind of broke. Again, this game is a little bit buggy. At the same time, it's just not fun. However, what is tied to that that is a lot of fun are some of the bonus missions, in this case, the Assassin Crypts. There are six in the entire world, and they're not very well hidden or anything. They're even shown on your map, provided that you have scanned the environment. 
they are their own missions and they're structured very interestingly. So you're getting rewarded for exploration with a different style of mission. And this mission typically takes more mechanics from the Prince of Persia games. They're basically just platforming and parkour challenges. And it really does feel a little bit different having basically all combat from the game removed. And the game, aside from, again, the few moments where the parkour janks up a little bit, it feels like a completely different game, and I would say almost entirely for the better. And when you complete these crits, then you get a seal that when all six are collected, you get the best armor in the game. However, this then goes to another feature I don't like about this game, a feature that would carry on up till Assassin's Creed Rogue, I believe, and that is that Ubisoft really don't want you exploring their giant open world. And as someone who likes to explore in games, that's a bit of a problem. See, I guess they just don't want you exploring different parts of the environment too soon, so they erect these giant white barriers that if you cross, you die because your character did nothing historically significant in that area until later on in the story. But as an explorer, not only does this completely break my immersion, but it just doesn't feel natural and it just kind of destroys my want to actually explore this. And it drives me absolutely crazy because I know there's like more awesome secrets out there I want to go find. But I can't until I play the story, and I mean, case in point, I love this ultimate armor in the game. The very earliest you can get it is like 85% the way through the game. That kind of sucks. Oh, and one other thing about exploration that I don't like, this game has a lot of other collectibles, mostly tiny little insignificant things. For example, feathers, which are like the worst things ever, and you have to understand this game came before its sequel, Assassin's Creed Brotherhood, which was the game that wrote on that giant slate marble of giant open world sandbox games, if you have collectibles, you have to put them on a map. Yeah, you're not finding your collectibles on the map here. You better find a map online, you better not go after it until the entire game unlocks, and of course, you better hope you haven't collected any at this point, or else, well, good luck finding them all, because it's a giant mess. Oh, and what's even better, the unlockable for all those feathers? A thing that makes you automatically hostile to every enemy in the game. Yeah, these feathers are the biggest waste of time ever. But, on the bright side, for those exploring who are willing to wait till the basically end of the game to actually explore all the game, you have a grand total of six sandbox maps to explore. Now granted they are of varying size, only Florence and Venice are actually of decent size, but you've got uh, Tuscany and Froli, which are decently sized, with Tuscany being basically entirely vertical, which is an interesting twist, as well as a very small little mountain chase sequence area you can explore I guess, but there's nothing there, as well as your own home base of Monteregioni. Now, this leads to another mechanic I don't like. You get to build up this place, you get to build up this fort, you get access to your own armory, your own blacksmith, your own tailor, a place to buy paintings and stuff, and as you buy businesses for your little fortress, it gets more money. That goes to you. And it's interesting to see this place slowly go from this ramshackle, almost pretty much entirely destroyed fortress, to this thriving community. And as you do put more money into this place, you see more and more just civilians wandering around. If you happen to buy a brothel, well, suddenly you see a bunch of courtesans walking around. If you buy barracks for mercenaries, you see them walking around. It's really interesting to see your purchases actually make functional changes in the world around you. Unfortunately, we then go back to the fact that this really just exists to give you income. You put money in so that every 20 minutes there's a deposit you can pick up to add to your money ball, but there's no point to it. By the time this feature is unlocked, which is I think chapter 3 in the game, you can already complete it, provided you've been looking for treasure chests and stuff, up to about 72%, at which point you're making about 10,000 florins every 20 minutes, and you'll have nothing to spend it on. I mean, hell, by the end of the game, I had about 450,000 florins I couldn't do anything with. You know, this is a problem that Assassin's Creed would have for a very long time. You know, you're investing money in something, and while you get money back that you can pour into your character or something, the end result is that you're going to have so much that you have nothing to spend it on. And that creates a weird balance issue, especially considering that, like exploration, a lot of equipment is gated to various chapters in the game. Like I said, by chapter 3 I was already making 10,000 florins every 20 minutes, I wanted to buy like end game armor at this point, and that wouldn't be accessible until chapter 8, chapter 9. I was stuck using level 1 armor, which I couldn't even buy all the parts to. You know, and I, I think that that is sort of a great indicator of what this game is. It, it's very, very indicative. 
It's a game that has a lot of interesting ideas, a lot of great ideas, but not everything pans out exactly the way it should. For every good idea, it has something that kind of lessens its effect or its impact. And it's a damn shame because I love this game a lot. Oh yeah, and before I forget, this game is actually lacking a feature that the previous Assassin's Creed had. Yeah, the previous Assassin's Creed had a feature where you could replay chapters that you'd already completed. Completely gone in this game. In fact, I think a lot of fans were annoyed with this because the story of the second game, one of the characters actually brings this fact up when they reinstate this ability. But yeah, if you want to play this game, it's a one-way trip, which... You know, kind of sucks. Maybe I want to replay the starting missions with endgame gear, just for footage or something. Can't be done. But overall, Assassin's Creed 2, for all of its problems, it succeeded for a lot of reasons. It's well made, and for all of its glitchy bugginess and half-thought ideas, there's still a lot of good here. Exploring the different weapons while largely pointless is still kind of fun. Assassinating people? Yeah, it's great. And climbing towers and exploring crypts is an absolute blast. But, like I said, there's a lot of jank, and I think that for the time and even now, I'm willing to accept some of that jank just because the story and the character is so good. Now, the overall presentation to Assassin's Creed 2 is... Ooh. Yeah, yeah, this game didn't do faces right. And I don't think this is a matter of simply the time this game came out. Even when this game came out, I thought the characters just looked horrible. And this game has a nice little feature where Ezio's model is pretty much just Desmond's face imposed on... The assassin's armor and unfortunately up until like the last chapter where Ezio decides to grow a very nice beard he's basically just Desmond in a hoodie and once you see that you kind of can't unsee that Ugh, the faces in this game are bad but at least when you actually go into the past they're marginally better but uh, not by much that said the actual character models while dated, still look okay, you know, ignoring the faces. The environments look fantastic. I think it's a little weird that each environment feels like it has a different filter applied to it. And you can really see this in some of the Venice stuff, because I was wearing, like, the same black armor that you can see in Florence, and it actually showed up blue there. And going back to Florence, it feels like there's, like, a sort of warm orange filter over the camera, whereas Venice has more of a cold blue filter. It's a very simple thing, but it does change the tone of the area a lot. And the overall soundtrack is iconic. I mean, the main theme of this game to this day is still worked in as basically the main Assassin's Creed theme at this point. And I mean, just walking around town, it feels very ambient, but you can also hear like a woman singing in the background. And the only way I can describe the music in this game is just kind of ethereal. It, it feels very majestic while still being kind of otherworldly. It's, it's really beautiful. Jasper Keed made an awesome soundtrack with Assassin's Creed 2, and he would continue to do great work moving forward with the series. The voice acting is a little bit iffy. Everyone kind of speaks in sort of like these really generalized Italian accents, and as I understand, it's kind of gringo Italian as taught by Google Translate. That said, Roger Craig Smith's Ezio totally captured my heart. I heard that he didn't know how to do an Italian accent when he played Ezio. You know, true or not, damn he's good. Overall, the presentation to Assassin's Creed 2 is a little bit dated, and the faces are just atrocious, but everything else about it is pretty fantabulous. Now, if you want a copy of Assassin's Creed 2 on the 360 PS3, uh, I'm playing this on the Xbox One Ezio collection, which also comes with the two sequels to this game. Uh, cheapest one I'm seeing right now is $3.50, and for that, totally worth it. Assassin's Creed 2 is an excellent game. Yeah, I think the overall story's a bit short, and while the Ezio collection reinserts two DLC chapters that were ripped from the game, or at least feel ripped from the game, seriously, you get to that point and they just say, oh, well, um, we're, we're skipping this part, sorry, unless you have the DLC, and honestly, those DLC chapters are kind of crap. There's a lot of content to this game. It feels very, very short if you get invested in this and you love exploring and just looking at all the architecture like I do. And while it has its problems, for $3.50, $4, $5, Assassin's Creed 2 is an absolute steal. I think I paid something like $50, $60 for this back when it came out, and even then I did not regret that choice. This is the game that made me a fan of Assassin's Creed, and you know, then Assassin's Creed 3 happened and then I really started doubting the series, to the point where I'm still not 100% on it. But you know, I still like to consider myself a fan of Assassin's Creed. I've played almost all the main entries with 
I think at present the only exception being Origin, and by and large they're all very good. But without Ezio to have, you know, spearheaded Assassin's Creed being more than really just sort of a modified Prince of Persia game, I don't think we would have all these Assassin's Creed games. And I mean, say what you will about where the series has come, where the series is going, and how pretty much every open world Ubisoft game is the same, Assassin's Creed is a very historically important game for Ubisoft, for, you know, open world sandbox games, and, you know, I think it's an absolute must have. There's so many different ways you can get a hold of this game, and, you know, if you have any interest, I think Assassin's Creed 2 is a great place to start. Because, I, I mean, you're playing with the best character, and one of the most interesting, well-fleshed-out stories the entire series has. Assassin's Creed 2 is an excellent game, and it comes highly recommended. May I come in? Fine, but only for a minute. A minute is all I need. Indeed. Well, wait, uh, that came out wrong. Christina! Christina! Svelia! Your tutor will be here soon. Come, my daughter. Is it really so terrible that... Figlio d'un cane! What is this? Perdonate, messere! Chiedo venia! I'll kill you! No, no. That's not necessary.